Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is Friday, October 6, 2023. Back from a one-week hiatus, I'm Dave Weitzberger, co-CEO of CoinRoutes. It's time for This Week in Crypto, and all eyes are on Southern Manhattan, where the trial of Sam Bankman-Fried is going on. And the title of this piece this week is What Me Worry? Because Sam's defense amounts to a Mad Magazine parable, a character that used to be called Alfred E. Newman, and that was his tagline, acting like he didn't know what was going on. Well, we'll talk about it more later after we go through the markets, but the reality is he knew exactly what he was doing. And while it was audacious, uh, it was certainly not ignorance that was going on. But how did the markets react over the last couple of weeks? And essentially, Bitcoin is climbing the wall of worry. It's up around 5% or so. Most of it this week, the week before, not a whole lot happened. Ethereum is actually down this week. But over the two-week period, it's up a couple percent. It's definitely underperforming. Uh, the thing that's interesting about Ethereum was the debut of ETH futures, which we'll talk about later, clearly was underwhelming. Uh, a couple of other points that are worth looking at. A Solana has been rallying rather strongly. It's up around 15% the last couple of weeks. And that's despite the news that uh, the FTX estate is likely to sell a billion dollars worth of it. Well, I mean, liquidity doesn't trump you know, it doesn't trump everything. And in this particular case, they said they're going to stretch it out over a long period of time. And there have been some good technical news in the Solana front. So that's driven that. The only other piece of news that's interesting from a market's point of view is Filecoin, identified by the inestimable crypto haze in Singapore at his speech at Token, and then on his uh, Substack, talking, explaining why Filecoin might be one of the major beneficiaries of the AI revolution. And so that's up a bit as well. It's still way below its all-time high, but it is definitely trending in the right direction over the last couple of weeks. Okay, let's get to the news. And first, we want to talk about Sam Bankman-Fried. The fact is, the first couple of days have been damning. Uh, he's had multiple people, most notably Gary Wang, saying that he knew about the hole in the balance sheet, that he understood that customer funds are being used. But I would take a step back and basically take a look at what was going on, because what he did was simple. FTX, as Michael Lewis asserted, is a good business. And that good business was probably throwing off before expenses, extraordinary expenses, uh, was probably throwing off a few hundred million dollars of profit a year and probably not a whole lot more than that. You know, even if it was crazy, you know, it would have been half a billion. Even if it was a billion a year, it would be insane. But it wasn't making that much, uh, certainly not over the last couple of years. But they were spending an unbelievable amount. In fact, they, for that, that good business, outspent almost any other company, probably multiple other companies, to be the largest political donor of the past cycle. They named stadiums after themselves. They put patches on uniforms so that anybody watching a baseball playoff game last year, not this year's ones they're about to start, they saw FTX. In short, they spent more money on marketing, arguably, than companies the size of Apple or Google, which, of course, is ridiculous. But if what you're trying to do is build the illusion of safety, the illusion of scale, the illusion of size, that made sense. But beyond that, even if all the money they spent on marketing and political donations came from profit, which is extremely unlikely, the fact is they sold it to professional investors like Sequoia on the basis of revenue that was the agency revenue from the exchange. And in reality, what they were doing was faking revenue from their, their hedge fund, Alameda. But none of that matters in the criminal case. What matters in the criminal case is something very simple. Did Sam knowingly take misused customer funds? And his argument is that he didn't know Alameda was sucking dry the entire collateral base of all his customers, which, of course, is absurd. Now, it's absurd for two reasons. First of all, if you're the CEO, you absolutely know what the status of your bank deposits, of your customer deposits, all those things. You pay people to do that, and it's a question that you would have to ask. But beyond that, there's the question of the FTX risk engine. And this I have other people talk about. So that's why I want to focus here. In testimony in front of the Congress, trying to get the FTX risk engine approved in the United States, he specifically talked about correctly that their risk engine allowed for limited loss to collateral posted. Meaning you post $100,000 and your position goes against you to the tune of a million dollars, you lose 100000 you don't lose a million. 
Now, that gap, that in this that example, that $900,000, if in fact the position didn't get liquidated in time, would be owned by the overall exchange, which of course is only as strong as the capital base that its customers contributed into and retained earnings. So if you're running an exchange, you understand how that works. Well, here's the problem. He testified about limited loss. He testified that there was no socialization of loss. Yet, that's exactly what happened. Alameda's losses got socialized the entire pool because they were given, as Gary Wang testified, the $65 billion credit line. Yes, that's billion with a B for those playing along at home. So obviously there's something going on. But even personally, I know this. First, I did a blog post called The Bizarro Worldview of Sam Bankman-Fried on the CoinRoutes blog, where I showed clips where one of them, he specifically talked about the fact that customer deposits need to be segregated. And secondly, he specifically talked about the fact that with volatility events, such as a 15% drawdown in ETH or Bitcoin, that the liquidation engine, if it worked properly, would not create the need to socialize losses. So he was very aware of that. But even more than that, before I wrote a specific article on the subject, I went to Brett Harrison, then president of FTX US, and asked Brett, hey, how did the FTX risk engine work when Bitcoin dropped and Ethereum dropped 15% on such and such a date. I don't remember what date it was, it doesn't matter. He said he doesn't know, but he'll go ask Sam. He came back a little bit later and said, Sam says on that day, the FTX risk engine worked perfectly, it liquidated, and only a de minimis amount of funds were lost to the exchange, the pool they keep for paying off losses, so they don't have to socialize losses on their customers. That is very damning because that is specifically Sam's argument wiped out in a nutshell that he didn't know that was happening. So let's not go into the rest of the details of the case. We're going to be talking about this for weeks, unfortunately. But the one question I was asked in a conference this past week is also worth mentioning. So a bunch of people in traditional finance said, hey, doesn't this FTX thing doom crypto as an asset class? And my answer to that is exactly the opposite. In fact, had FTX not blown up, last year, had Alameda bet on the markets dropping instead of on the markets rallying, and had they made money and not had a big hole in their balance sheet, the problem is, is the bond villain level plan of Sam Bankman-Fried might well have worked. He might well have been able to write crypto regulation in the United States, which would have prohibited most competition against FTX. It would have locked in an oligopoly and made it impossible for things like distributed finance and decentralized finance to actually work. That's important to know. But on the other hand, if you look at what the, the damage was, yeah, the political types that he embarrassed are very embarrassed. I mean, Maxine Waters thanking him for his candor days after the blowout is going to go down in everyone's memory. And we can see that in her continuing remarks about crypto, not, not voting along with several fellow Democrats to get the FIT Act out of committee. But, you know, it's out of committee anyway. But what really matters here is a simple question. If you think crypto is going to be ruined by people like Sam Bankman-Fried, consider two things. Number one, first, did Bernie Madoff destroy equities, destroy asset management or equity returns? Answer, no. People realize he was a lying sociopath. His crime was huge. He targeted the wrong groups, but I'll bet you every one of the groups he targeted, the ones that survived, did not stop investing in the stock market. Second, the responsible people in the crypto industry continue to ask for basic regulation, not for the least of which to make sure that companies such as exchanges who make statements are held to those statements as being accurate, that there's some level of auditing, that there's some level of customer segregation of assets, that there's some way to protect customers. All of these things are what people like Brian Armstrong has been calling for. And more power to him, that's the right way to go. It's the reason that exchanges even out in Asia, such as OKX, are working with Copper, and they were the first ones to do so, to segregate client assets in a third-party custodial network. So there is definitely is things going on in the industry that are moving in the right direction. To look at FTX as the negative case as to why it was broken is ridiculous. It actually gives impetus to those things that will improve the industry. So we'll see how the case goes. I'm hoping for a perp walk because we know that generates a rally. And who knows, maybe him being walked into court is why Bitcoin is trading over 28000 as we speak, as opposed to 25000 and change a few weeks ago. But there are a couple of other stories that are interesting this week. We'll, we'll go through them quickly. First, or next anyway, is the CFTC is now investigating going after Steve Ehrlich. 
It's about time. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Steve Ehrlich, as the CEO of Voyager, told his clients that they were giving them money, giving them their, their Bitcoin, and that he would act an agent, act as an agent to lend Bitcoin out to borrowers in a fully collateralized manner to be able to pay them yield. When those yields available drop, instead of telling that to his investors and cutting yields, he panicked and he sought out high-risk loans from, an, uh, from a Singaporean-based hedge fund, Three Arrows Capital, and lost all that money to their, for his investors. Frankly, I've talked to many of their, his investors, and they all, or at least the ones I've talked to, had they known what they were actually doing, would have pulled their money out. So yes, that's fraud. And yes, I'd like to see the CFTC go after him. Frankly, it should be criminal, but we'll let that, let that play out. Who knows what the DOJ is looking at. Next case that was interesting, the Ripple case, the XRP case. Judge Torres was smart. And as I predicted several weeks ago, based on my friend John Deaton's prediction, because frankly, I don't know nearly as much as John does on the case, that Judge Torres would allow the SEC standing to ask for an interlocutory appeal, but would deny it. And when she denied it, which is what she did this week, she denied the appeal, but she took the opportunity to explain why her reasoning in this case is better. Why XRP trading on a secondary exchange in this case was not a security or an investment contract. Why Judge Rakoff, who was talking about Do Kwan and a part of a fraud investigation, were different facts and circumstances. Well, she did that. And now at this point, for Coinbase to do anything, they would have to wait till after the trial to appeal, which, by the way, for those counting at home, will be after this particular administration has been replaced, either by a new Biden administration, another Democrat, another Republican, and whether even this particular SEC is still in place by that point, most people don't think it will be. So more or less, this is going to cement XRP as not a security as secondary trading. Uh, for the foreseeable future and maybe forever, but we'll see how that goes. Lastly, I said I would comment about the Ethereum ETF, the futures ETF, and I think it's really important to understand something. Two things matter here. First, futures ETFs are a trading vehicle, not an investment vehicle. The Bitcoin uh, futures ETF is underperforming spot by north of 8% per year. And it could actually be worse depending on how much it costs to roll futures. For those who don't know what I'm saying, if you have a futures-based ETF, you buy the October future. And then before, before it expires, you have to roll that, sell the October future or let it expire and buy the December future. And every time you do that, you're paying a premium to do that. Or most of the time you're paying a premium to do that. Bitcoin's premium that rallies a lot. But the fact is, it's underperformance to a spot ETF is rather dramatic. And those who in Bitcoin, they say, oh, well, 8% doesn't matter. They don't understand. The actuarial goals for most pension funds are between 6 and 8%. If you tell a pension fund you're investing in a product that's going to underperform the asset it's supposed to track by 6 or 8%, they're going to look at you like you're crazy and they're going to fire you like that. So no long-term manager is using these products to buy or sell. They're using it as a trading vehicle. Now, that matters because if you look at what was going on, the day the Ether Futures ETFs came out, I was watching a coin route screen, and I saw the premiums for the Bitcoin futures were dramatically higher, double. It was trading around 80 basis points, whereas the Ethereum futures were trading around 40 basis points. Yet, if there was pent-up demand to buy the Ethereum futures ETF, that would have been reversed. So there obviously was not that demand. And in point of fact, probably people were using it to short Ethereum. And as a result, it didn't do very much. And Ethereum underperformed Bitcoin during the week after it went live. That is not a surprise to me. But looking at these premiums and seeing how it's trading is very important. And so anybody who's looking at the market, I would encourage to watch the differences in those prices. Okay, that's enough for this week. To have a great weekend out there. We'll get ready for the next week of the Sam Bankman Freed Circus, and who knows what'll happen.